like to say good evening to everyone. All right, just seeing if you're paying attention. I'd like to say good morning to everyone. So good to see everyone here on this morning that thought it not robbery to study another portion of God's holy and divine word. Uh, there are some familiar faces I see in the audience, and then there are some faces I haven't seen before, but maybe you have seen me even though I haven't seen you. And so if you've never uh, seen me before or heard me preach before, uh, I'm nothing like Shane Scott. I know he did your meeting uh, earlier this year, but mainly the, the biggest difference between Brother Shane and I is that I'm just a tad bit darker than he is. Uh, but other than that, you're going to get the same gospel that is always preached here. Uh, I'm, I'm just leaving Midland, Texas, finishing a meeting there uh, last week. And so um, when I asked uh, what should be the theme for this week, I looked on your website, listened to a few sermons, and so I figured I was going to preach something pertaining to drawing near to God or drawing nearer to God. And I said, well, what did Brother Shane preach? And I was told. And then I said, well, what do you want me to bring? And they said, well, you know, whatever series you have that, that you think would be beneficial to the congregation. And I said, okay. And so I started working on something until I got a text 10 minutes later and said, you're doing Ephesians 4. And so <laughs> I didn't volunteer for Ephesians 4. I was voluntold that I was going to be uh, preaching on Ephesians 4, but it's a great text, and I, I look for, I, I really enjoyed putting together uh, the series of lessons for that. I just wanted to put it together in a comprehensive format that I thought would be beneficial uh, to this congregation. Now, usually, when a preacher puts together a series for a gospel meeting, uh, the local congregation is the guinea pig first to be able to work out all the kinks and then say, okay, I figured all that out. Now I can preach it to the people I intend to preach it to. Didn't have this luxury. You all are the guinea pigs uh, for this series. And then based upon how you respond, we'll see if it's appropriate for me to bring it home <laughs> and, and preach it to the brethren in Tucson. But I just want to thank you for the invitation. This meeting has been in the planning for quite some time. We know that COVID has derailed a lot of things. Uh, this is not my first time preaching in Cincinnati, but it is my uh, first time preaching at West Mason. And so uh, we are looking forward to having uh, Scott Taylor preach for us in our fall gospel meeting in 2023. Can't wait to have him uh, come and uh, work with us for the week uh, in Tucson. Now, he may get a little confused and say, I thought this was the fall gospel meeting because in November it's still going to be in the upper 80s. <laughs> and it's going to be fine. There are no changing of leaves on trees because we don't have trees, we have, ca we have cacti. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is no grass, we have rocks, you know. <laughs> but we do have uh, people that love the Lord in that city and it's growing each. Uh, the city is getting bigger every day as well as the church and we're just so thankful for the work that God is doing, doing in that geographical location. Uh, before we uh, go into our series on Ephesians chapter 4, I believe it's very important for this part of the class to do an overview of the book of Ephesians. Uh, the book of Ephesians is a very uh, important book, a very easy book to read, but it's a very practical book that uh, you can read it as a devotional and learn something on a daily basis that will help you to become a better Christian. Uh, it's one of those books that if you really want to get your Bible reading in, the book of Ephesians is one of those books. Uh, one of the things that many people struggle with is trying to do some type of daily Bible reading. That's why we rely on things such as devotional books that has a scripture or two in it so we can see, so we can at least say we got it in. But I've learned that if you look at the book of Proverbs and you read a proverb a day it does keep the devil away. I mean, you, it's 31 uh, chapters in Proverbs. You read a proverb a day. You could finish that book within a month. Uh, for the days to have, for the months to have 28 days, 29 days, or uh, 30 days, you're just going to have to, on that final day, just finish the book. 
Uh, if you want to do a reading of the gospel accounts, we see that Matthew has 28 chapters, John has 21, Luke has 24, Mark has 16. And so if you read uh, each of the gospel accounts per day until you get done uh, with all of that, you can read all four gospel accounts in one month if you read four chapters a day. And then after the first 16 days, you now only have to read three. And then after 24 days, you only have to read, or after 21 days, you only have to read two. After 24 days, you only have to read Matthew, and you would have completely read the entire gospel account. Uh, or if you look at the book of Psalm, I've been doing a series of Psalms. I know Psalm has gotten me through the pandemic that every gospel meeting that I've done prior to this one has been a series on the book of Psalms. And so it's re quite refreshing that I get to talk about another book of the Bible other than the book of Psalm. Uh, but if you read five Psalms a day, you would have finished all 150 in any given month. As a preacher of the gospel, I make it a habit and I try to tell the young men in our preacher training program that you have to be very familiar uh, with the preacher handbook that God has handed you, and that is 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. We do a lot of reading out of those books. As a matter of fact, in the local preacher study that we're doing in Tucson right now, we're just hearing preachers preach and teach and give lectures on each chapter in those three uh, books that has really been blessing my life. But when you look at the epistles of Paul, these short epistles, especially the epistle of Ephesians, it's an epistle that you could read in a day that, that gives you the information that you need as a Christian as to what you need to do to get into Christ. And then you read the second half of the book in which it tells you what you need to do to stay in Christ. And so the book of Ephesians I found to have been a very effective book in my personal Bible study to try to bring people to Christ Jesus. You read chapters 1, 2, and 3, it tells you the benefits of being in Christ. You read Acts chapter 19, which talks about the church in Ephesus to tell you what they did to get into Christ. And once you have convinced a person what they need to do to get into Christ and why they should be in Christ, you look at chapters 4 through 6 that convinces them and shares with them what they need to do to stay in Christ. And that's the, the, the usefulness of the book of Ephesians. So I just want to talk about the epistle itself, and then I want to talk about the city as to why this epistle is so important. And then I want to talk about the church that was established in this city and some things that we can learn as people of the 21st century, free moral agents, Christians in this uh, millennium, if you will, that will help us to make heaven our home as a result of learning from the lessons of our brethren of yesteryear. And so first, let's talk about Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is named such is because it was written to the disciples that were in this place called Ephesus. Now, the time frame in which this was written puts us around either si between 60 to 62 uh, A.D. Some may say 64 uh, A.D., but if you read the book of Ephesians, uh, using Acts sort of as a barometer, if you will, to try to plug in some of these epistles in chronological order. It would bring you to an earlier date rather than a later date. This epistle was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, we see that the Apostle Paul was very important to our faith in regards to him being used by the Holy Spirit to write the things that he wrote since he penned over half of the New Testament. Now, just to see if anybody's good with math, how many books are there in the New Testament? 27. Who said that? Outstanding. So you are clearly the smartest one in this congregation. <laughs> 27. All right. And so how many books did the Apostle Paul write? Okay, I have the answer of 14, and then the sister that's sitting uh, directly in front of me, she gave a look just like 14. <laughs> so, so what's the answer then? You don't know. Okay. <laughs> I know it's not 14. <laughs> 
Uh, some say 14, uh, but more conservative estimates say 13. And the reason why is because you have this book called Hebrews in which there is no author stated in that book. Many believe that it was written by the Apostle Paul, but the Bible does not say. But I do know for certain who did write it. It was the Holy Spirit, and so I am confident of that. But as far as who was the earthly writer, the one that the Holy Spirit moved to pen those words, we do not know, but many believe it to be the Apostle Paul. So if you believe it's Paul, the answer is 14. If you believe it is not the Apostle Paul, then the answer is 13. So that brings you either slightly below 50% of the New Testament or a little over 50% of the New Testament because half of 27 is what? 13 and a half. All right. Very good. Very good. And so uh, we see that the Apostle Paul did write approximately 13 or 14 books of the New Testament. Uh, Ephesians is one of those books. He even says himself in the beginning of the book that he is the author. Uh, it is considered one of four prison epistles. The reason why they're called prison epistles is because these are at least four letters that he wrote while he was in prison. Now, these are not the only letters that he wrote while he was in prison. I mean, when you read uh, 2 Timothy, clearly he was in prison, but it's not called one of the prison epistles. So it's dealing with a particular or a specific imprisonment that the Apostle Paul uh, was in, and that would have been his first imprisonment in Rome, which is the imprisonment that we read about that started with his arrest in Jerusalem, and then it brings us all the way to him being in a prison in Caesarea, waiting to appeal to Caesar. He stands before Felix and Festus and King Agrippa, Herod Agrippa II, and then he survives a shipwreck, and then he finds himself in Rome, where he finally appeals to Caesar, in which Jesus Christ himself told him in Acts chapter 23, verse 11, that you're going to make it to Rome, and you will be standing before Caesar, and you will testify about me before him. And so we, we read that. Now, this is one of four prison epistles. What would be the other three that he wrote around the same time? Yes, sir. Close. Let's remove Galatians, and then you can either phone a friend or ask the congregation <laughs> and, 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 and get the fourth one. So you got Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians. There was one more. What was it again? Philemon. Philemon. Very good, very good. And so these were the four prison epistles. Uh, three were written to congregations. One was written to an individual. Uh, the letter to Philemon was written to an individual uh, addressing a form, a, a slave of a ne uh, the slave of Philemon, a man by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus fleed uh, Philemon, who was a Christian, some way, somehow, he bumps into Paul while he's in prison in Rome. He became of service to the Apostle Paul. And so the Apostle Paul let him know what his responsibilities were. Now, since he is a Christian, that he has to go back to Philemon. But he accompanies Onesimus with a letter to Philemon to remind Philemon as to how he needs to respond uh, to Onesimus and he's not to take advantage of him because he is a Christian but he's to treat him like any Christian would and so that is the discussion in that particular letter we see the letter that is written to the Philippians which is a letter of joy the Philippians were meeting the needs of Paul the, Philipp the church in Philippi would have been a church that would have been established during the second journey of the Apostle Paul uh, around Acts chapter 16, as a matter of fact, uh, God had a plan. Paul wanted to go to Asia, which is where Ephesus is in 
uh, Acts chapter 16, but the Holy Spirit forbade him, Silas and Timothy, from going to Asia. And that night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, please come here and help us. And so he figured that that was God's way of saying he doesn't want me to go to Asia. He wants me to go to Macedonia. They go to a city in Macedonia called Philippi, meet a young lady by the name of Lydia. And Lydia was from where? Starts with a T. Someone is spelling it. <laughs> yes. Yes, Thyatira, Thyatira, very good, very good. And Thy Thyatira is bo located where? Now, I'm not looking for longitude, latitude, or anything to that effect, just general area, what continent? Asia, very good. So God says, I don't want you to go to Asia, I want you to go to Macedonia, but the first person you're going to speak to in Macedonia happens to be from Asia. <laughs> and so that's what, this is just how the good Lord works. And so after that, he then gets arrested for saving a young lady's life. And then him and Silas get beaten, thrown into prison. And then he baptizes his jailer, which is known as the Philippian jailer. And so hence the church in Philippi get started with the conversion of these two souls and so he starts to write to them and the emphasis of that letter is joy uh, the Colossian letter and the Ephesian letter are roughly the same letter that's why you can tell that they were pretty much written around uh, the same time people even consider it a communal letter that the people in Colossae was supposed to take that letter and share it with the people in Laodicea and Asia and, I mean and uh Ephesus and the people from Ephesus was supposed to take their letter and send it to Colossae and Laodicea to, to, Laodicea to share uh, with the brethren there as well. But when we look at the book of Ephesians, we see that its theme is God's purpose in Christ. God's purpose in Christ. One of the most powerful phrases that you will ever see in scripture is in Christ in Christ blessings are in Christ salvation is in Christ Romans chapter 8 verse 12 21 uh, verse 1 tells us that there is no condemnation in Christ if I had the choice to be in Christ or out of Christ which one do you think we should choose to be in Christ baptism puts us in in Christ, Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Again, in Christ is the safest place to be at all times. Wherever Christ is, I need to be in him. In the pandemic, I was so glad I was in Christ. When I'm in an airplane, I'm so glad that I'm in Christ. If I'm visit, if I go through it to an unsafe neighborhood, I'm so glad that I'm in Christ. If I have to have a conversation with people who have risen up and have called themselves my nemesis, my antagonist, my enemy, my adversary, I'm so glad I'm in Christ. We need to be in Christ because in Christ is God's purpose. Everything God wants to accomplish for us on this time side of life is in Christ. You will not find it outside of Christ. It's always in Christ. And so look at some of the things that the letter talks about when we look at the letter to the Ephesians. It tells us in chapter 1 that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. And so it helps us as Christians to recognize that everything that we need has to be of a spiritual nature. And if it's of a spiritual nature, then God has given me all things that pertain to life 
and godliness according to 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 and those things are in Christ and so if it's in Christ it's absolutely essential if it's outside of Christ I can still survive without it. And this is what separates the Christian from the rest of the world. One of the things that the Apostle Paul shares with the young preacher Timothy, he says, let me let you in on a secret. If you got food and clothes, <laughs> you're doing better than 75% of the planet. You're doing just fine. That means that you are blessed of God. And if you just have those two things, then you are not without excuse as to why you can't worship him and why you can't give him thanks and why you can't give him praise. I mean, you wake up in the morning, there's no chalk outline around your body. I mean, that's time to celebrate and know that, yep, today is going to be a good day. Because somebody else didn't wake up. There's so many people that die outside of Christ. And so because you are in Christ, all spiritual blessings are in him. We also see that we're saved by grace through faith. This is why it's so comical to me when people in the denominational world say, well, you believe in a work-based found uh, salvation. We, well, we believe that we're saved by grace only. And I'm just like, the Bible doesn't teach that. Because if we're saved by grace only, then that means that everybody's saved. Because that means that everything depends on God and God alone. Well, it does. And then I'm like, well, where is that in the Bible? And then they go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, that teaches that we're saved by grace through faith. So that means that I need grace and I need faith. Yeah, like I said, grace only. I'm like, no, but you need faith. See, grace is God's part. Faith is our part. Grace is how God responds to man. Faith is how we respond to God. That's why we're not even saved by faith only. Because if we're saved by faith only, then that means that grace has nothing to do with it, and therefore we can save ourselves if our faith is strong enough. Yes, sir, my friend. Absolutely, absolutely. And the only reason why that faith even did anything is because God accepted it. And so because of God's grace, Abraham's faith was acceptable. Bingo, and that is the pattern. Because again, we're children of God by faith, right? Which makes us descendants, the spiritual descendants of Abraham. Has nothing to do with ethnicity. It has nothing to do with Genealogy. It has everything to do with faith. And so one of the things that we learn in the book of Ephesians is that God saves us by grace. We need faith to enter into Christ. And so that's how we gain access to these spiritual blessings. According to Ephesians chapter 2, we go a little further in Ephesians chapter 2. We learn about the oneness that we need to be one in Christ. That's how everybody is one in Christ. Everybody in here has different backgrounds, different makeups, uh, different upbringings, different levels of education, different levels of income, but none of these things are the reason why we are here. The reason we are here is because of Jesus. And Jesus is the great unifier that can bring all walks of people together. That if you take Jesus out of the equation, we may not associate or talk or communicate with the person that's sitting next to us. I mean, think about some marriages. I know that if it had not been for Jesus, I know my wife would not be married to me. She wouldn't even talk to me if it had not been for the Lord. Lord is also an excellent matchmaker. He did that because of my relationship with Jesus and her relationship with Jesus. She recognized the fact that, yeah, she has a type. She wants somebody that's tall, dark, and handsome. But because I was in Christ, I'm short, tan, and terrific. And so, therefore, it just worked <laughs> out because we all have the same purpose. 
in Jesus Christ. And so Paul talks about that, not dating specifically, but being one in Jesus. We go a step further, we come to Ephesians chapter 3, where he talks about the revelation of God's mystery that has been revealed in the gospel. This is why the gospel message is so important. It's more than just talking about the biography of Jesus Christ, who his earthly parents were, where did he come from, what verses talk about his coming, what is he supposed to do when he gets here, how was his life as a child, what was his ministry as an adult, yes, he died, was buried, and rose again, what is he doing right now, yes, all of that is inclusive in the gospel message, but what the message is really about is good news, that by Jesus doing what he did and becoming the sacrifice for our sins, we now have a right to eternal life. He died for us so that we can live for him. And that's what Ephesians chapter 3 talks about. And then we begin to get into Ephesians chapter 4, which talks about the unity in the body of Christ as well as our new life in Christ. That means the things we used to do, we don't do those things no more. And then we come to Ephesians chapter 5 in which that entire chapter is dedicated as to how we're supposed to walk in this new life. How we're supposed to conduct ourselves. Who is it that we're supposed to be imitating? What are we supposed to look like? Who are we supposed to look like? How do we treat one another and so the apostle begins to give instructions he gives instructions to husbands and wives this is how you conduct yourself in the marital relationship he gives instructions to parents and children he basically shares with parents don't you provoke your children unto wrath and then he instructs the children this is how you Learn, here's the secret to living a long and prosperous life. Obey your parents. Why? Because your parents brought you into the world and they can also take you out. And so one of the things that someone told me, is they said, Antoine, do you have any grandchildren? I said, not yet, thank God, because I got two daughters in college and if they having kids and neither one of them married, we got a problem. <laughs> and so I said, I don't have grandchildren yet. They said, oh man, when you get grandchildren, they're such a blessing. He said, because I've learned that grandchildren is God's rewards to parents for not killing their children. <laughs> I said, okay, I, I can't wait. <laughs> if God's going to bless me in such a way. Uh, but we see that, God, that the Apostle Paul gives instructions to parents and children. He also gives instructions to slaves and masters. And then we see in chapter 6 that he talks about the whole armor of God, how we're supposed to dress before we leave the house every morning, what, how we're supposed to, what we're supposed to put on, because every day is a battle. I was told a long time ago that the life of the Christian is nothing more than battles and blessings. Either we're fighting or we're being blessed because we endured the fight. As a Christian, we're either entering the storm, we're either in the storm, or we're coming out of the storm. But you're going to get wet for as long as you are on this time side of life. You can't avoid it. But if you're in Christ, you can endure it. If you're in Christ, you can rise above it. If you're in Christ, you'll be able to make it to the other side. And so the way we do that is with the armor that we wear. This is why we pray. This is why we have our minds stayed on Jesus. This is why we increase in faith. This is why we always are equipped with an ax and 238s when we're trying to tell somebody about King Jesus. I hope somebody got that ax 238. We talk to people, repent and be baptized. Okay, all right. So I guess the people on this side of the room don't read their Bible. I got a few that do over here. Okay, I understand. I'm just kidding with you. I'm just kidding with you. All right, and so we also read throughout the epistle when we look at chapter 1 as well as chapter 3, the absolute necessity of prayer. See, because prayer is how we talk to God. The Bible is how God talks to us. 
So there has to be that type of communication. We talk to God through prayer. He talks to us through his word. We make sure that this relationship is not one-sided. We're always telling God what we need of him. But then this Bible is God's way of telling us what he needs from us. It's the word of God. He's given us instructions as to how we need to conduct ourselves. And so this is all that the Apostle Paul shares in this letter to the Ephesians. Now, here's the deal about the city of Ephesus. That was the intro. Let's talk about the city now because God is so strategic in everything he does. I remember being privileged to be able to start a few local congregations and, and, and wanting to learn more about what it takes to plant a church. So I've talked to some brethren and met with many people to try to figure out the best way of doing it. I've learned some things. People have said, why don't you write a book on this and, and so forth. And I'm just like, yeah, maybe one day if I have time, I don't know. Just reading how churches were started in the Bible, reading what other men are doing even today to try to establish congregations where there is no church. And it just hit me that if I just simply read the Bible, God has already given the blueprint, a blueprint that is perfect, that, that the gospel has to go where the people are. And when you look at the four largest cities in the Roman Empire at the time of the apostles, Ephesus was the fourth largest. The largest would have been Rome. It was the capital. It was the headquarters. That's where Caesar was, right there. That was the largest. But then the second largest was Alexandria. A lot of that had to do with the Ptolemies and the relationship that the Caesars had with the latter dynasty of the Ptolemies and where uh, Alexandria was uh, one, uh, the lighthouse in Alexandria was one of the seven uh, ancient uh, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, there was a library there where people received a lot of knowledge. This is why I believe the Holy Spirit, when talking about uh, Apollos in Acts chapter 18, makes mention that this guy happens to be a Jew from Alexandria as to say that this guy was highly intelligent, well-studied, well-read, and even someone with that IQ could humble himself and listen to two tent makers explain to him the way of God more perfectly that turned his heart and he starts preaching the truth. And so it just goes to show that you had these two huge places. The third place was Antioch, Antioch in Syria. We know that why that place is so important is because it's the third largest. We also see that uh, this was a place that was run by the Seleucid dynasty. Uh, and then, okay, that's the five-minute bell, all right. So you had the Seleucid dynasty. But then it was in this church, in this city, that we see that the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. I often scratch my head as to why. I mean, because there was churches established in Jerusalem, and then throughout Judea, long before the gospel even went to Antioch, and Samaria, and then we have the Ethiopian treasurer, and then we got churches in Damascus, got Christians there. Why does God wait until Antioch to give the designation of Christian to those disciples, a name by which we are forever remembered and known by? And I believe it's because the Antioch church actually fulfilled the prayer that Jesus prayed in Acts chapter 7, I mean in John chapter 17 that we all may be one that means it doesn't matter of your race or your ethnicity if we can get all people of all nations to come together in one place and worship God Jew and Gentile because those are the two groups of people that the gospel is designed to reach then we now have an example of Jew and Gentile worshiping together. Antioch was the first church to do that. God says, yep, 
That's why my son died, so that all congregations can look like this one right here. They're Christians. That's the new name that we see in Isaiah chapter 61, 62, and 65 that the prophet prophesied about. And so we see that Antioch was a large city that the gospel spread and went there. But now Ephesus happens to be the largest Roman territory in Asia. It was a port city. Everybody, if you want to get to Asia, you have to go through Ephesus. Now Sardis tried to compete with that, but Ephesus had something that Sardis didn't have, and that was the temple to the goddess Artemis or Diana, in which people came from all over to see that place. So if I had a choice of going to Sardis or Ephesus, and I am an idol worshiper, guess where I'm going? I'm going to Ephesus. And, and so Paul used that as an opportunity that the Bible even shares with us in Acts chapter 19, verses 8 through 10, that because of the work that Paul did in Ephesus, all the residents of Asia heard the gospel. That's a lot of people that everybody know who Jesus is, which means that it's possible that everybody in Cincinnati can know who Jesus is, that everybody in Ohio can know who Jesus is, that everybody in the Midwest can know who Jesus is. If we just start talking about him, that everybody in Tucson can know who Jesus is, that everybody in America can know who Jesus is, that everybody in North America can know who Jesus is, if we just simply talk about him, and so this is what made Ephesus such an important city. Uh, during that time, we're talking about a quarter million people at, at some of the conservative estimates, but that's a lot of people even today in a city. And you're thinking about almost 2,000 years ago to have to manage that many people at that time without the Internet, uh, without people going door-to-door -door with senses that are made out of paper. I mean... There's a lot of stuff that was going on back then, but they were able to uh, uh, maintain and grow as a city. Now, this church, Ephesus, the church in Ephesus would have been established around Acts 19. It started in the synagogue. Paul preached in that synagogue for about three months until <laughs> the rulers of the synagogue said, wait a minute. He's saying some things we don't quite agree with. And it only took them three months to figure it out. <laughs> And so they kicked him out. He goes to the school of Tyrannus, starts to build up the congregation there, and he started that church with 14 people, Aquila, Priscilla, and the 12 disciples that used to be followers of John, but then heard the gospel from the apostle Paul and realized they needed to be baptized into Christ. And he stayed with that church longer than he stayed with any church. Two years. We learned later that it was really three years total that he worked with that group of people when we look at Acts chapter 20 verse 